that's all I have for today. And we're going <laughs> to turn it over to Richard Farley. He's going to talk with you a little bit about my example of general courage. I notice everybody, do you know about this class? We gravitate to the back end of the class. <laughs> I just came from uh, teaching the, well, the people as seniors as well as the uh, graduates and instructors. And what I thought I'd do today is rather than, uh, you know, I, I didn't expect the thing is I'd put like 12 buildings up on the wall and you go remove the picture of the building. Bill has told me that uh, what we're looking at this semester are waves, right? Am I right? We're looking at fluids, right? Uh, light, sound, right? So that I, I thought it'd be wise to give you one. Good example in, in my career that has touched on each of those things and things you sort of had to be aware of from the design side so you don't lose the control of the design process. Very often when you're out designing a building, you'll have all these wonderful knowledge people come in and they'll advise you to do this or to do that. And it may not be what your gut is telling you is going to be the best part of the building. One of the best ways to make sure you don't lose that control and kind of give it to them is to have some basic knowledge of things. So to ask questions. One of the key things I'll teach you today is the question mark is your most valuable tool. Because it completely frees you from any feeling of guilt or inferiority or stupidity by just adding something on the back with a question mark. Are you ready to pour that concrete? Do you think this is really going to work? How long has this been used? Just tell me roughly how long. You know, those kind of things where you're not, right? Because you're the, the person that's going to take that knowledge and do something with it. And the second thing I wanted to point out today is that while Bill lives in a world looking for precision and exactness in the world of physics, is the ultimate quest, as I understand it for a physicist, is, is to get to those absolutes. You know, F equals A. In the world of architecture, in the world of design, we deal with the world of approximates. And just as water will seek its own level, we'll use any means necessary to justify a design decision out there. If it means that we're reaching into the world of science to do that, Great. If it means that we're applying quasi sciences or something, it's fine. But we often are designing within ranges of things. And knowing that the range has acceptability in it doesn't necessarily mean we have to know exactly where the boundaries are. We just have to know the performance level, the general perception to the public, the people using our building, is that they're well taken care of. So if you're in this building right now, you assume that the fire alarm system is working adequately. We assume that the exits are all well marked and that they're adequate to be able to take care of the charge of people out to those. All those things we assume we take kind of for granted. So with that in mind, I sort of went back to think of some things in terms of how physics is used to be able to understand and justify buildings as they design. And starting with waves, and I think we may have used this example last time, that I've spent a lot of my life, uh, maybe four years, working on the most northern of the high-rises downtown, which is called Bell Atlantic. And Bell Atlantic is a rather narrow building, so it's got a wide face on it. It's got very narrow Gothic proportions on the sides, like 1 to 14 in the height of the thing. So it's got sort of an elegant pr profile. Um, but and you know Philadelphia from having been here for a few years, and you know the wind in Philadelphia comes out of the northwest. And therefore, that building takes the wind right on its, on its front of these. And because of Hook and Newton, that building has got to move to be able to carry those loads. And when the building gets hit with it, it starts to go into an oscillation. Right? So I was thinking about waves and what that all meant. And realized that if I took, and do you use yellow trees anymore? Yeah, OK, one. But if I took a long roll of uh, uh, kitchen paper towels, OK, that was very long, and had somebody on that side hold it, and somebody on that side pull against it, and I put a pencil on top of my head on Bell Atlantic Tower, and I start to take and react to wind. If I slid back and forth, the fact that time is in the equation, all of a sudden, if I take a look at the tracing that developed by the, the uh, paper moving off my head, would be the form of a sine wave. Right? Think of it. I'm going to oscillate back and forth with the wind. Right? So my pencil is moving in this direction, but now I've got paper moving off my head like this. So this is a time function. Therefore, right, I could do a trace up there that would look very much like, not very much, would be a sine wave. So what I started with today, I wanted to let you know, that sine wave is really important when you design a building and really important in terms of the people and the comfort level that the people have within the building for this reason. Okay? If I take that sine wave, right, my pencil's moving back and forth, but the blackboard is moving, I start to get something that looks like this. Right? 
And if I draw an axis through here, given the stiffness of the building, stiffness has to do with the moment of inertia, uh, uh, geometric uh, configuration, has to do with the materials that are in there, has to do with the way that I've kind of organized this thing in the height. If I take a look at all those characteristics together, I notice something very unique about this graph. And the thing I notice is that if I keep doing this thing, and let's say the wind hits with a greater amount of, uh, of, of force and causes my oscillations to grow, therefore my amplitude right, is going to increase, this wave is going to do this. No matter how much I hit that building and cause it to sway greater and greater in distance back and forth, what's there, which is this, right, because that's the rate at which the paper is flowing by, these increments stay the same. The building has a characteristic about it. It's formed by its materials, the way those materials are joined, and the way that uh, uh, the stiffness of the building acts, that it develops what's called its own natural period of oscillation. And regardless of how hard I hit that building, that building is going to go out and back and in in the same amount of time. Regardless of how far back it goes, how far forward it goes, how back it, it has to work within that time frame. But for me, that was, it took an awful lot of time to kind of get to, to you can understand that in a physics class, you know, we're talking about natural phase oscillation. But to feel it is another thing. Now realize, in terms of the building, if I really pound this thing on the side and these oscillations you know, go way up and way down, if you start to think about the simple thing of the velocity that's attended, the accelerations that are attended as a result of this, right? at one point I have zero acceleration and zero velocity. At one point I've got maximum acceleration and my, my velocities are increasing. Interesting thing for me is that if you, I think we have told you again, I'm using my old stump speeches, but if you were born in a wagon, Right? Blindfolded, moving at a constant velocity, you wouldn't know that you were moving. You can't feel velocity. Changes in velocity, we can feel. The acceleration, that's like the roller coaster feel. Or when you're on the swing, you reach back and you pull up and you get that feeling in your stomach here. That's acceleration. There's a point, a magic point here, where I can find an acceleration due to the sway of the building where people will not be comfortable and they'll be looking for those adequate bases to get out of the building. It's around 0.25 mg of a potent. It's, it's there. We are very sensitive to those kind of movements. So again, waves, real important. In order to make sure if I have a building that's very limber, a real rabbit of a building, and I want to and I want to get it back into some kind of balance where that acceleration doesn't get to be extreme, there are a few tricks I can play, a few things I can do. You know that if I come along here and I develop a wave that works counter to this, right? I do the simple math of adding the two waves together, and all of a sudden the amplitude of the original wave is diminished, dampened by the second wave. Okay? So you may know this, but there are buildings downtown, there are buildings in Peru that have things called two mass stampers in it that are in there. Like in the one in uh, Comcast has got this gigantic U shape of water in there that's sloshing back and forth, not in sync with the natural oscillation of the building. Therefore, as it's moving to the side, the building wants to go that way, there's a little bit of a collision, a little bit of a collision here, and it helps dampen out the building and make sure that it doesn't go into extreme amplitudes, therefore extreme accelerations that would cause the people inside to be nervous or 